The title of this morning's sermon is The Struggle of Asaph and the Goodness of God. As we wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, let's admit it, there can be times in our lives when we look at people in this world, people who do not repent of their sins or believe in Jesus, and what do we do? We slip. We stumble because we become envious of them and because we forget that our God is good. This is a very real thing. We might look at how non-Christians live and wonder, wow, how nice would it be if we lived like that? We might hear how non-Christians talk and we might wonder, man, how cool would it be if we talked like them? We might know how non-Christians think, and we may wonder about how good it would be if we thought like that. And so we are tempted to go down this path because we're envious of those people, their lives, how they're doing. And moreover, we're, we forget that our God is good. And so this is such an applicable uh, sermon and text for us this morning, especially if you have ever wondered, is it really worth it being a Christian? Have you ever wondered, is God really worth it? If, if you've ever thought that, if perhaps you're even thinking that now, then you are not alone. Eight, Psalm 73 is a story about a man named Asaph as he went through this very struggle that we're talking about. Asaph, not to be confused with Aesop, the guy who wrote Aesop's fables, Asaph, he was a singer and a musician and probably a leader of some sort in the worship in the temple in the Old Testament times. During the time of King David, this Asaph was the guy. He was there. He authored actually many psalms in the book of Psalms, and this one's a big one, Psalm 73. But this one's big because it's an honest and heartwarming story, a story about Asaph's faith and Asaph's struggle as he also, like us today, he had to look at this world, live in it, but need not be of it, as he had to learn how to wait for the promises of Christ Jesus. And so, our brother in Christ, Asaph, I hope that you can really connect with him, relate to him, and apply what he went through for your, for your lives. Okay, so let's start with this. What exactly did Asaph see when he looked at unrepentant, the unrepentant people? Well, basically, he saw how they lived. And in his eyes, they looked like they were blessed. They had prosperity. They didn't really experience pain. They had no pangs until death. They had more than enough to eat and drink. That's obvious because Asaph wrote how they had bodies that were fat and sleek and eyes that were swollen out through fatness. You know, in modern times, being fat is kind of a negative thing, but in those days, being fat was a symbol, a reflection of the fact that, hey, you ate well. <laughs> and that's understandable given that back then, famine was a normal thing. Most people were dirt poor. And so Asaph sees that, and he's like, they're eating well. They're drinking good. They're blessed. What, did, what else did Asaph see? He saw that these unrepentant people were not in trouble. They were not stricken like the rest of us. They seemed to always be at ease, and they were increasing in riches. So Asaph saw all of this, and in, and, in, and in his eyes, 
these people, these unrepentant people, they're enjoying the good life. And so all of this led to a very profound struggle in Asaph's heart and mind. He thought that in keeping his heart clean and washing his hands in innocence, being a Christian, he thought, what's the use? This is all in vain. Look at them. Look at how good they have it. Look at me. I have it bad. This is not worth it. This was Asaph's struggle. We too, like Asaph, may start to believe that things like righteousness and holiness and obedience to God, we might think, this is not really paying off for me. Maybe you're at work and you see that your non-Christian co-workers advancing because, well, they're doing some pretty shady stuff. You, on the other hand, you're a Christian and you're not doing anything shady. You're trying to obey God and be righteous in the workplace and, well, guess what? You don't get promoted, you get shunned, you get ridiculed, you're ostracized. Vanity, right? We too may start to think like Asaph thought, seeing corrupt people win the day, seeing evil people reap the rewards because of how they do things in life, things that we don't do. But now we wonder, maybe we should do it? Asaph struggled in that he admitted to God that God's people, we are tempted to turn to those who do not repent of their sins and believe in Jesus, and we're tempted to find no fault in them. We may actually start to believe that the viewpoints, the choices, the lifestyles of such people are actually good. And we see that in the church today. I don't want to go on a rant, but i got to say it, how the American church in general, in general, has become so worldly, has adopted the viewpoints, the choices, the, the desires of the world, and now the church doesn't look like the church anymore, in general, because they think, the church thinks, that the ways of the world are actually good, right, correct. We don't see any fault in that. Let's do what they do. Asaph, he struggled also because he was being persecuted by the world. He talks about how he was stricken all the day long and rebuked every morning. And my goodness, that is, that's real. The Bible talks about how It's like a spiritual test that when we are persecuted, we are tempted to give up our faith, to change our minds when we go through suffering for Jesus and say, well, okay, I guess let's not be a Christian then. And then I'll be accepted by this world. Then I won't be persecuted, stricken, rebuked by others. So Asaph struggled through all of this. And the thing is, he admitted some very sad and sinful things about himself. And this is good. He saw how the world was. Yes, he struggled. But he admitted a few profound things. He admitted that he was envious of the unrepentant. Man, that's pretty serious stuff, to admit, to write it out, to say before the Lord, I was envious. I had a deep discontentment in my heart. I saw what I didn't have. I saw what the unrepentant people had, and my heart was filled with desire, covetousness. I was jealous. He admitted this. Asaph also admitted that his feet had almost stumbled, that his steps had nearly slipped. He admitted that he was heading toward that life of walking in the counsel of the wicked, standing in the way of sinners, sitting in the seat of scoffers. He almost threw away his commitment to God. He almost threw away his character. 
This is what he admitted. Sad, but a good starting point toward healing. But here's what's most heartbreaking about what he admitted. Asaph admitted that he was foolish toward God. It was personal. He admitted that his soul was embittered and he was pricked in his heart and he had this kind of disposition against his God. Asaph, he admitted, I was ignorant. I was brutish. I was like a beast towards you, God. This is what he admitted. This is what we can admit too. And so our brother in Christ, Asaph, struggled like this. Highland, have you ever struggled like this? Are you struggling like this now? Perhaps you are envious of non-Christians in their good lives. Perhaps you like their thoughts, you like their words, their plans, their stuff. Perhaps you compare yourselves to them and maybe think, I think this honestly, personally, several times a year. I look at my bank account, I look at my budgets every month, and I think, <laughs> if I didn't have to give my tithes and offerings to church each month, and I'm looking at that number, I'm thinking, man, the world doesn't have to do this. What could I do with this money if I didn't have to pay this offering? give this offering. That's my struggle. That's the struggle of many Christians today. Perhaps you want to eat like them and drink like them and look like them and roll in money like them. Perhaps you are tired of being a Christian Perhaps you're tired of a Christ, being a Christian who is a loser in this world rather than a winner in this world like the rest of the world who are not Christians. Perhaps your heart is full of discontentment. Perhaps you've thought about throwing away your Christian life, running away from church, moving on from God. Perhaps you've wondered whether it is worth it to love and serve and obey and follow Jesus. If this is you, you are not alone. I confess as your pastor, I struggle. Asaph, one of the key dudes in the temple worship, the leader of the music and the songs, before King David, he struggled. I'm willing to bet that the people next to us, the people that we call Highland Church, many of us are struggling now. You're not alone. Let's look at how Asaph got through this struggle. Let's look at what happened to him. By God's grace, Asaph remembered and believed that judgment and justice comes for those who do not repent of their sins and believe in Jesus. By God's grace, Asaph saw these people that he envied for who they really were, and he envied them no more once he knew what was true. What was true? God loved Asaph. And so when Asaph went into the sanctuary of God, that is when God brought him the church, yeah, the Old Testament church, when God put Asaph under his holy and perfect and life-giving word in the sanctuary, when God made Asaph see the actual sacrifices that were being made in the temple, when God showed him all the blood all the death that pointed forward to Jesus and his gospel, 
when God, who loved Asaph, gave Asaph a reality check through the temple, showing Asaph that the heavenly realities were far greater in glory than anything that the world, the world could experience. When God drew Asaph near to the throne of grace, when God cleaned up Asaph's mess in his heart and mind, and when God gave Asaph discernment, wisdom, and understanding, that's when Asaph knew their end. Their end. How the story would play out. Where the unrepentant people were ultimately going to go. Where they're headed towards. And that killed his envy in a good way. By God's grace, Asaph remembered what was going to happen to them and he remembered what is going to happen to him. Praise be to our God. This sounds so basic, so simple, but you've got to understand, pastors talk about this a lot, it comes down to your identity and a proper understanding of who you are, a proper understanding of their identity, who they are, their story versus our story, who they are with, where they're headed, versus who we are with and where we are headed. Not to say that we are better than them, that we're cocky, that we're over them. No. But it is to say that our gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is better than theirs. And we have a great treasure that we want to share with them. They should be the ones envying us. How weird is it that we envy them? Praise be to our God that God loved Asaph. Even though Asaph was brutish, even though Asaph was ignorant and like a beast towards God, do you see how God is so patient towards Asaph in this story in Psalm 73? God caught Asaph. He, God stopped Asaph's stumbling of his feet, the slipping of his steps. And so while Asaph was on his way to leaving God, God did not leave Asaph. And so this is how God, Asaph remembered and believed in the reality of what was going to happen to these people. Asaph understood who they really were. They were arrogant and wicked. Pride was their necklace. Violence covered them as a garment. Their hearts overflowed with follies. They scoffed. They spoke with malice. They're lofty. Uh, they, they loftily threatened oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens. That's so messed up. Their tongues strutted through the earth, and they said things like, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Asaph understood this by God's grace. And so, suddenly, their lives were no longer appealing to him. There is nothing good about living life with no fear of God. There is nothing good about flaunting sin as they were doing. There is nothing good about speaking against God and against his people. Nothing good about being blind to the truth, rejecting the reality of what is eternal and glorious and there's nothing good about trading God's promises for something like a bowl of stew. Hashtag Esau. Asaph saw that this was not good. What he thought was good, he understood that it's not good. And what he thought was not good, being a Christian, not good? No. He learned that being a Christian is good. It's the way to go. Asaph, he remembered, he understood what God was going to do to them. Asaph declared that God would set them in slippery places and make them fall into ruin. That's kind of poetic justice. Asaph, he said he was about to slip and fall, 
But now he says, God will make them slip and fall. Asaph believed with all his heart, soul, strength, and mind that God would destroy them in a moment, that God will sweep them away by terrors, that God will despise them, that God will reduce them to nothing, like a dream without weight or substance or glory, that God would put an end to them. Now, quick side note, this sounds so bad, but later on, Asaph will go on to say that he wants, wants to declare God's good works to these people, to the world. So he wasn't saying, yeah, God, kill them all. I like that. No. He was saying, God is going to kill them all. They need to hear the gospel of Jesus before they receive their due punishment. And so, right now, in this life on earth, these unrepentant people, they may be blessed. And that's kind of how the world works right now. You see people who are not saved, and they are having a great life. But do not be fooled, church. They are not going to be blessed at the end if they don't repent and believe in Jesus. What is truly the blessed life is a life of forgiveness and eternal life with Jesus. Their thoughts, their words, their plans, their stuff is all worthless. But God's thoughts, the words of the Bible, the plans of the church, the stuff of heaven, that is worth everything everything they are not the true winners Highland they are actually the true losers and we look like losers now in this world but we are the true winners there is one final thing that happened to Asaph and then I shift to closing this sermon. Asaph was reminded of the simple but glorious fact that God is good. This is, this sounds so simple, but this is the remedy, the healing for the bitter heart. For those of us as we look to this world and we're like, man, I envy it. Highland, you need to know, you need to remember this morning that God is good. Truly, God is good to Israel. That's how the psalm starts. Truly, God is good to us, his people, to his church. This is true. In the Old Testament, God made amazing promises to us in his covenant of grace. God brought us, I know that sounds weird, it's like I wasn't there, but we are the church, united, whole, Old Testament and new. God brought us out of Egypt and into Canaan. God removed our enemies from the land. Asaph remembered all this, the fact that God is truly good to Israel. God is good to us. Highland, do you believe that? Do you really know in your heart that God is good to you? <laughs> you know that you have it way better than the rest of the world, those who do not repent of their sins and believe in Jesus. God has forgiven you of your sins, and he's given you eternal life. God has given you a home and a place at the banqueting table of the kingdom of the new heavens and the new earth. Truly, God is good to you. But that's the Father. Let's think about Jesus, the Son. Jesus, he lived a perfect life of righteousness and obedience to the law, and he credits all of that to you, so now you are declared righteous. Jesus has been truly good to you. Jesus suffered and died for your sins as a sacrifice in place of you so that you may be free from the penalty of sin and death in hell. 
Jesus, he's truly been good to you. Jesus rose again from the dead, and that's a guarantee that you too will rise again from the dead at the end of your life. Jesus has been good to you. And let me briefly mention the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in you now. He, the third person of the triune God, He is working in your life to sanctify you through the Word. And He is interceding for you and He's helping you to pray. He's with you. He is the guarantee of all of God's promises. Truly, no, truly the Holy Spirit is good to you. And I have to talk about this, how Jesus, I'm going back to him, he is the one who fulfills this psalm, Psalm 73. Asaph, he's the one who is the human who wrote this psalm. He's the voice of this earthly king of Israel in Psalm 73. But Jesus is the true eschatological king of Israel here in Psalm 73. What do I mean? I mean this, that as our representative, Jesus' feet never stumbled. His steps never slipped. In Matthew 4, remember when he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness? He did not desire earthly bread that would make his body fat and sleek. Instead of commanding stones to become loaves of bread, he said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. As our representative, Jesus did not go against the will of his Father. He did not set his mouth against the heavens. He did not betray the generation of his children. And so when the devil told him to throw himself from the pinnacle of the temple and be rescued by angels, Jesus said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And as our representative, Jesus he did not make pride his necklace. And so he said to the devil, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. So you see here, I could say more, but Jesus is that king of Israel in Psalm 73. Though Asaph speaks as a human, Asaph is ultimately quoting the words of Christ himself. Jesus, his heart was pure. He was clean and innocent of sin. Righteousness and obedience to the law was what covered him as a garment. And yet, he was despised and rejected. He was oppressed and afflicted by men. He suffered. He died on the cross for our sins. But for all of this work, for all of this love, he was exalted by the Father. The Father held up the Son's right hand, the hand of power and majesty, and heaven received Jesus into glory. Jesus did all of this. Jesus fulfilled Psalm 73. He did all of this for your salvation. And so Asaph said it so well. Highland, remember that God holds your right hand too. You are continually with God. God guides you with his counsel. God will receive you to glory. God loves you. In other words, Highland, truly God is good to you. And so Asaph responds to God's goodness. And this is the response that we all should have. He writes, Whom have I in heaven but you? There is nothing on earth I desire besides you. Wow. What beautiful words of faith and hope and love. Asaph desired God himself. His relationship with God was more important than any other. This does not mean that 
All other relationships were worthless. No. It just means that your relationship with God is of highest value. And no one can take that away from you. Asaph understood that God was his, was his creator, that his life was defined by God and given by God, and that he owed everything to God. Asaph wrote, my, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Here, Asaph believed that God sustained him. That God was his main reason to keep on going. That God was his portion forever. His treasure, his inheritance forever. These are loving words coming out of Asaph's mouth. And so, what a happy ending. Asaph didn't need, he didn't want what the rest of the world had. He had Jesus. It was good to be near the Lord Jesus. And it was good for him to tell the world about Jesus, about his salvation. So instead of envying their unrepentance, those who seemed to have everything, he loved them and pitied them because they had nothing. And he wanted to tell them of God's good works, evangelism. In the last paragraph, Highland, simply put, when you struggle, please remember the goodness of God. When you struggle, ask yourself, how has God been good to me? Because truly, God has been good to you. We just forget. We get distracted. There are more words coming from the world in our brains, but we got to fill it with more words from the Bible. You'll forget less then, I'm sure. I hope that you would be able to speak like Asaph did here in Psalm 73. People love the Psalms because it's so quotable. Quote it. Say things like, there's nothing I desire but you, God. My heart and strength may fail, but God, you are my portion forever. And consider this. Remember, it's, it's going to happen. You're going to meet Asaph face to face in the kingdom of the new heavens and new earth. I look forward to you sharing with him how this psalm is such an encouragement to you. Highland, you are not alone. You are not alone in your struggles. Asaph, he went through all of this and he wrote it and he wrote a psalm about it. If you're going through struggles, you are not alone too. May Psalm 73 really become your own psalm for your own life. You have hope. You are set for life, eternal life. You have nothing to lose. The war is over. Sin and death has been conquered. You are a new creation. You have all the reasons to be joyful. Why? Because truly God is good to you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that you have truly been good to us. Thank you for giving us your son, Jesus Christ. I pray, we pray, that we would know that you are good to us. We forget this. Asaph forgot it, and he almost lost everything. Thank you for your mercy and your grace in our lives. Help our church to know for sure and to confidently walk in this world, not envying the unrepentant, but telling them of your good works. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.